Great. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our second desk side chat with Dr. Manning of the of 2021. Um, these are for those of you who were unable to join us during the first one. Um, these are um, you know, hosted by Harbor Fields Council of PTA. So that includes all of our PTA units, uh, high school, OMS, Washington Drive, TJL, and SEPTA. Um, we are pleased to have you all here today. Uh, we are joined by, obviously, Dr. Manning, our interim superintendent, um, as well as Ms. Sharon Donnelly, our assistant superintendent for business, Ms. Maureen Rayner, our assistant superintendent for human resources and instructional services, and Ms. Kelly Fallon, our interim assistant superintendent for curriculum, instruction, and administration. Um, and my name is Lisa Mindell, co-president of the Harbor Fields Council of PTA's executive board. Um, and I will now kick it over to my co-president, Natalie Mason, um, so she can give us a little information about something that's coming up, which you should all know about. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. So just a heads up to everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. And we hope that you're going to join us again next week on March 12th and 13th for our annual scholarship variety show hosted by your uh, Council of PTAs and uh, brought to you by literally uh, the entire district. So kids from uh, K through 12 sharing their talents with us as well as family and community members. We have teacher administrator participants. And of course, we're really thankful to all of our PTA members for their support and our volunteers for helping us get this program on the road. So please, if you haven't had a chance yet, pick up your tickets as well as toggle over to our website so you can find ways to uh, support the show this year so we can hand out lots of scholarships to our seniors. And I think with that, we're ready to get started right to our questions. Yeah, we'll kick it over to Dr. Manning in case there was anything you wanted to say before we get into our questions. Good morning, thank you. Uh... Lisa and Natalie, I certainly appreciate it. I want to thank the PTA for sponsoring this, this event. Uh, it's, it's especially crucial for us to make sure that we are communicating with uh, our constituents, our community, our families, uh, so that they're aware of uh, uh, all the thing, great things that are going on. But you know, we always count on the PTA for your support, and we're so grateful for that. You touched on the variety show as just one example. Uh, one thing we want to make sure that the community understands is that everything that uh, uh, goes to the variety show, goes right back to the kids, 100%. So those ticket sales, uh, I'll give you a hint, even if you can't attend both nights, you know, every, any ticket purchases or support we can have, uh, again, ends up right back to our kids who uh, certainly could use the support uh, in, in, in going off to college uh, uh, to help out with our family. So really do appreciate your support, anything you can provide, but thank you to the PTA because the amount of hours and work is just tremendous. A lot of people might be under the impression that running a virtual event might be easier in some way than running a physical event. But having done it most recently with our Black History Month celebration, I can tell you that's just not the case. It is. Uh, it, it takes a, a team, and uh, I'm so thankful for the PTA for their support of that. I do want to acknowledge my team that's on here with us, uh, Maureen, Sharon, and, and Kelly. They are uh, working tirelessly every day to to make those events that we do uh, run and, 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 the, and the processes. And you know, you're gonna hear, uh, hopefully in some of the questions that come out, you'll get a sense of the, some of the challenges that we're facing. And I would not be able to do anything without the three uh, individuals that you see on the screen uh, because they just, they make everything happen. And uh, I'm so grateful to them for all of their support. Um, this has been a difficult transition, but you know, we've, been, we've been moving forward and doing great things. I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing. I do want to acknowledge for the community some upcoming events that we have on our end. In addition to the Variety Show, uh, you got a recent notice about the March 10th uh, uh, work session from the Board of Education, where we'll be presenting on the, uh, uh, the recent survey that went out and the uh, prospect of returning additional students to uh, in-person learning. Um, as I've said all along, is this is something that we all want. We know that students are uh, do learn best when they are in person with their teachers and we are uh, underway in, in, in that. So um, out of fairness to the Board of Education who has not yet heard uh, the plan, that's what the work session is about. We, we have an opportunity to, to work with the board um, and be able to, to present, have them be able to hear it, provide comment. That's the true essence of a public meeting in, in 
in full transparency. So um, the, while the public may not have an opportunity to comment at that time, you will have an opportunity after that, subsequently to that. And then of course, um, on the March 17th meeting is ultimately when recommendations will be made and uh, we will we'll be able to move forward at that time. In addition to that, we also have the budget process that's going on, which is very important for our communities to stay engaged with. I encourage you to visit our website. Uh, Mrs. Donnelly will be conducting our third budget presentation um, in that process. And it's important that community remains engaged in that. We have uh, you know, committed to working with the budget to maintain our programs, to emerge with a strength and instructional program. Uh, we know the challenges that we face. And so we are looking forward to be able to, to produce a budget that does that achieves all those goals. So again, I encourage you to um, attend those meetings. And if you can't, all of those meetings are recorded and placed on our website uh, where you can, you can find them. And if anybody has any questions, please know that we are accessible. People can reach out to us, uh, email or phone, um, and we'll be happy to, to, to get back to you as soon as, we, as soon as we can, provide you with the answers that you need. So uh, that's all for me, but again, thank you to the PTA and uh, looking forward to this conversation. Okay, great. Thank you. And uh, just as a reminder to everyone, these questions were pulled together from uh, all of our units, all of our PTA units. So they cover a range of topics from, you know, things that affect the entire district, um, all students to things that are more specific to, uh, you know, each school level. So we'll start with uh, broader questions that will affect everyone. And, and you'll notice that we, we then break it down a little bit. So to start off, Dr. Manning, I'm sure you're surprised that there's some questions about COVID. Yes. <laughs> but the first, <laughs> but the first question is, what percentage of Harborfield staff members have been vaccinated? Very good. So um, I don't have a specific number, um, but I can tell you anecdotally that as you speak to staff, and you can probably tell by my voice, we've been doing a lot of speaking with uh, staff. We've been holding nonstop meetings regarding everything from COVID to, you know, returning students to in-person learning to just the normal operation. It's been, it's been, it's been a great experience to get and make sure we, we uh, get out and speak with staff. The, I can tell you that a lot of people express frustration with getting appointments. Uh, that has been going on. And as you see, if you, if you, if you pay attention to the press release, phase 1B was originally for smaller group of people. And as you read the news every day, it is expanding, there's groups being added to that. And I'm not here to dictate who should be added or should, shouldn't be added, but phase 1B initially had a smaller group. It was supposed to be a, a 14 week process. And then as more and more people got added and there was difficulty getting vaccine doses that went from a 14 week process to now, I think it was six or seven months. Uh, they expect that phase to be completed. And that doesn't help when you add additional people to that. But I digress. The um, I just need the community to know that we're doing everything we can to support our staff in getting vaccinations. Uh, so recently, through my membership in the Suffolk County Superintendents Association, we partnered with the Suffolk County Department of Health to provide the limited vaccination doses that they did have specifically for our special education staff, because our special education teachers work very closely with our students in close proximity, I should say. Uh, so we were able to get a, a significant number of our special education staff uh, vaccination appointments. So that that is underway. And we're going to continue to take advantage of any opportunity like that that is offered to us. Um, we've explored the idea of becoming what's called a pod, which is a point of distribution. Um, that is something that, you know, we continue to explore. But right now, as you might read, the vaccination doses are just not available. To, so to make school point of access is not really something that uh, we're up to yet. It seems that the, the state is now focusing just on county level distribution. Uh, of vaccinations. But again, we're going to continue to explore those things. There was a recent, you might have read in the news, a recent executive order by Governor Cuomo, where he required teachers to report to districts if they were vaccinated. Um, that lasted about a day before it was pulled back. Uh, and because there was issues uh, related to privacy concerns and things of that nature. So now, as of yesterday, we were informed that the Department of Health is going to be reporting teacher vaccinations on a public dashboard. I don't know what that's gonna look like. Um, I haven't seen it yet, but that was the latest news as of yesterday that came through. 
Uh, so if, if that comes to be, the community should have some public dashboard where they can see uh, vaccinations. But again, I haven't, I haven't seen anything come out yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is COVID related as well. Um, we are wondering, are there any plans to expand COVID testing from certain athletes only to all students this year or next? All right, so uh, the, the issue of COVID testing is something that um, we're not permitted to require testing as a condition for students to attend school. So that's something we can't do. Um, I know other places have provided as a service on-site COVID testing, um, but that's not a requirement to attend school. So that's something that we couldn't do is to, to mandate COVID testing. What had happened with the athletes was that the New York State approved high-risk sports and a condition of that in Suffolk County was, uh, and, and that was at the county level that that decision was allowed to be uh, issued, that the county required weekly testing of student athletes to participate in high risk, high risk sports. So we've gone through four weeks of testing and I'm gonna knock on wood right now and say that 100% of our student athletes tested negative, which we're very proud of. And we we're very thankful to our coaches, to our administrators, to our parents and to our student athletes for everything they did to continue to play. So, um, but you know, to get back to your original question, that's not something that we could do as a requirement to attend school. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. How do you see Harbor Fields opening the valve similar to New York State? For example, school events in person, possibly outdoors eventually? Right, well, that's a really important question because people need to understand that the regulations haven't changed. You know, the, the six foot requirement, the, uh, you know, 12 feet for music or physical activity, the, uh, mask wearing, the barriers of under six feet where, where it's then possible, all those things haven't really changed. Um, so while there is, I'm gonna say a muddying of the waters because people don't understand how we can have two students wrestle on a mat, um, yet we can't you know, bring students closer together for proms and graduations. Um, so that, that's confusing and frustrating. And I, I, I completely understand that, believe me, it feels like every day the ground is kind of shifting under your feet because it's hard to rationalize that argument. The two kids that wrestle can't shake hands after the match, but they can wrestle. So that's, you know, we're happy that our student athletes can play. I just point that out as a point of understanding how, how the water's a little bit muddy on this issue. We're, we're navigating this, this kind of minefield of ever-changing regulations. Um, and so, you know, when the governor puts out regulations with regard to weddings, recently allowing venues to hold 150 person weddings, that doesn't apply to proms, that doesn't apply to graduations. So we have through our associations, through the Suffolk County Superintendent Associates and the New York State Council of Superintendents, met with the governor's team and asked him to specifically focus on regulations associated with school events because he might not be aware, but our students are buying prom dresses back in December. And we need to make decisions about how we move forward with these things because things need to be decided, things need to be put in place. We can't just do this on a moment's notice. We have, but it, it causes confusion and frustration. And I understand that. So it's important for, for the community to understand that we are doing our best to communicate the need for regulations so that we can make decisions. Uh, but absent those regulations, we are prepared to do whatever we can to provide a great experience for our students. So we've been meeting with seniors. I personally met with the leadership class at the high school. I asked them, if things don't change, how do you reimagine prom? I can't, you know, if I can't put you in a venue with a dance floor, how do, how do we reimagine prom? Um, you know, working with the building administration on uh, any numerous plans for graduations and all these different things that we, we want to make sure that we have for our students, but we know that, the, the, again, the ground is gonna shift under our feet as we get closer to these events because we're expecting, and I'm hoping and praying, that we get good news on our ability to conduct larger public events um, so that we can provide an opportunity for our students to participate in, in, in the events that 
you know, they hold near and dear to their heart, you know, and uh, I want to see that happen. We all want to see that happen. And so those, those are the things that we're working on. So, you know, we're planning for, if things don't change, we're planning if regulations do change and uh, we'll have everything, everything certainly uh, in motion for that. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, so I hope you packed your crystal ball for this one, but uh, <laughs> what will school look like in September? what I hope it will look like. That um, sounds good. Yeah, what I what I actually look like again, unfortunately, that that standard answer. It really depends on regulation and guidance. If we experience what we experienced last summer, if you remember, as we got closer and closer to school, it seemed like it seemed like more guidance was coming out every day, and every day we had to look at our reopening plan and adjust and adjust and adjust. We certainly hope that doesn't happen. That's why we're we're continuing to advocate through our associations for for clear and consistent guidance, uh, timelines for guidance, anything that allows a path so that we can, we can navigate along. Right now, um, if social distancing requirements stay in place, and of course mask wearing and uh, barriers less than six feet, all those things, I don't know how much of our school operation might change, might look different, um, there are things that we can do structurally, internally with scheduling that might allow us to operate a little bit differently, but the, the normal everyday experience of students might not change all that much. For example, one aspect of instruction, the remote instruction option, uh, that's something that's dictated by New York State and required to have, all districts are required to have that. So, you know, we've done an excellent job, in my opinion, of providing live synchronous instruction to our remote students. And so those students that are not in class get the same experience that part of a class. Um, and so when they decide that they want to return to school, they're in that class and they've been in that class all along. And, and you know, and I think that that's a really important feature of our plan because it's not the same. I can tell you even for my own children, it's not the same in other places. And it's a, it's an aspect that is Difficult, our teachers can tell you how challenging it is to provide simultaneous instruction to in-person learners and remote learners. It's, it's a challenge, but they've risen to the occasion. They're doing a beautiful job with it. Um, and they, they're, working, they're working their tails off to, 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 make it, to make it happen. And I'm really so proud uh, of, of what they've accomplished with that, um, with, that, with that work. My hope for the future is that positivity rates continue to decline. And in the fall, the science and, and, and the regulations support perhaps a look at social distancing requirements. Um, but even if that doesn't happen, you know, we, we work, work to create the, the most effective learning environment that we can. And one aspect of an effective learning environment is a safe, and learning, safe learning environment. So that's certainly something that we will continue to do. Um, but you know, we're, we're looking forward to you know, as we enter the process of planning for next year uh, through the budget and staffing and, and everything, we're looking to make sure that we provide the best learning environment for our students uh, and also have a plan that allows us to adapt should regulations and guidance change uh, in the future. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and I know that you had already addressed looking ahead this month in March, obviously the upcoming Board of Ed meetings will, will cover this discussion around um, the process around potentially reopening OMS and, and the high school and bringing more students back. So we do, we do know that there'll be much discussion later this month. We do have one question today um, regarding that. So we will ask, um, and it is, will 504 resource room and integrated students be the first students invited back at OMS and Harvard yeah. Fields High School? Yeah, so um, obviously that's a, a question that we've, we filled in and, and believe me, it's, it's a thing. There are other groups of students, ENL, um, homeless, we can go on and on, economically disadvantaged, students that are struggling academically, socially, emotionally, these are groups of individuals that we would love to bring back at any time. Um, and so our plan going forward, and you'll see this, is to work to bring all students back. Um, and we're not looking to, uh, at this time, uh, to, to differentiate because we feel that if, 
any differentiation is going to require the same level of intervention with regard to safety protocols, desks, uh, barriers, social distancing. If we can find a, a way uh, to bring students back, we wouldn't want to then just limit it to one group or another. Uh, we, we feel strongly that, you know, again, I go back to the statement of all students um, learn best in person. Uh, that's why we've always operated for, in the history of public education, as far as I know. And we want to make sure that we continue to do that uh, and find ways to do that. And so that's, that's our challenge going forward. And, and you know, certainly we'll hear more about that on the 10th. Uh, I know that that timeline is a little frustrating for people, and I, I get it. Um, our way of operating is always to do things safely and effectively uh, and responsibly for all parties. You know, if you go back to the month of January, we had 85 positive cases. In February, we had 17. Going back to the month of January, I'll be honest, we were, we were you know, there were days where we were looking at staffing saying, I, I don't know if we could open schools today because we have to make sure that all children are properly supervised. So to, to say that we were in a position to make recommendations about bringing additional students back is just not fair. Um, so that's why we, you know, we're, we're being very methodical in our approach to make sure that we can, when the buses pull up or the cars pull up and kids come out, that we have a, a place to put each child, make sure they're appropriately distanced. If where they couldn't be, they're behind a barrier, where they uh, have a seat in every classroom, this way to provide food service to every child, a uh, way to provide an effective learning environment, safe learning environment, uh, make sure our music classes can operate safely, our tech classes, art classes, where the, you know, no sharing of materials allowed, that, you know, all these things, computer labs, it's a lot to go in the operation, even the operation of the nurse's office and where you put children who, who have symptoms and provide isolation and all these things. I mean, the, the things that we did and we had months to do over the summer, now we're, we're, we're looking at all those aspects of the operation to make sure that we have a safe space to do all those things together. So um, that's a process that we're in now and you'll hear more about that on the table. Uh, yeah, no doubt a large undertaking there. Um, and I know you mentioned as well that you have more info for us on the budget over the next few weeks, but uh, looking ahead with such a low tax levy, will there be cuts to special ed programs? Great question. Um, so I want to look at you in the camera here and say no. Uh, we have, uh, as, you, as I said when I started the meeting, our goals within this budget are to maintain programs uh, and emerge with the strengthened instructional program. So we know that we have a lot of work to do with our students. Um, and so we are not at this time recommending cuts within the instructional program. Uh, we are working as we have, we, we have a phrase about str strategically reallocating resources. So there are times in your, in your budget, we all do this in our own homes. If we have a decision that we make as a family that we need to support one thing we see how we can move heaven and earth to make that happen. And so that's the kind of the process that Mrs. Donnelly is going through. And I thank her uh, for her, for her, you know, she knows <laughs> I bother her on the weekends. I'm like calling all times and she's always there to answer my calls uh, because we, that's the painstaking process that we're going through now to see how we can reallocate resources to emerge from this with our programs intact allowing us to strengthen our instructional program and provide the services to families and students so that we are in a good place uh, going forward. And that's our, that's our objective, that's our goal. So again, I encourage you to, to join us on March 17th for the budget presentation, become engaged in the process. If you haven't had an opportunity to take a look back at the first and second budget presentation that are on our website um, and get engaged in that process, I hope the community ultimately will uh, support the plan that we have in place because I think it's a, it's a good plan. It allows for sustainability going forward. Um, and it's something that, uh, you know, we'll be very proud of. Great, thank you. Okay, are there any updates around staffing in PPS? So, um, you know, I, I, I want to really talk about specifics, but I assume that people, uh, referring to the, uh, the director position and, and, and the turnover there. 
um, we generally when there's a resignation or a retirement or, or whatever, you know, there's a, a posting. So the position is posted, uh, applicants from all over the globe have an opportunity to apply. We go through an arduous process of uh, interviews and uh, several rounds of interviews and committee interviews and all levels of interviews. And we ultimately make a recommendation to the board. So with a transition like this, the goal would be for July 1st to uh, have a person in place. Uh, so we're going through that process net right now. And I have to thank uh, Ms. Rayner. Uh, actually, you know, Ms. Rayner obviously leading the charge on this, but the whole team is heavily involved in the uh, all of the administrative position that we currently have open right now. You might not be aware, but our director of athletics is retiring. Also, uh, Ms. Giordano, our OMS principal is retiring. And, uh, you know, God bless them. I'm, I'm very envious of their retirement, but at the same time, we know we have big shoes to fill and we're uh, out there trying to get the most qualified candidates that we can to, to provide uh, leadership going forward. So I'm very confident in that process, but the, uh, it, it, is, it is a time consuming process because you, you need to meet with each individual and have lengthy discussions with each of them and make sure that they are ready for the job because uh, you know, Hartfields is a unique place. We don't have many layers of administration. So when you look for a principal uh, or a director, you know, they have to be, they have to be jack of all trades, so to speak, uh, be able to, you know, that utility player that can manage, you know, the, the financial aspects, the managerial aspects, lead, leadership, personnel, uh, curriculum, you, you name it. There's several aspects of the organization that need to be run by our administrators and they do a wonderful job. So we want to make sure we get the best, most qualified candidates. And that's no different in PPS. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so shifting a little bit, uh, will field day for Washington Drive primary school students happening be happening this year? Field day is a very important event. We want to make sure that it happens. Uh, I remember my days, gosh, I remember my days of wearing the shirt with my handwritten number on it. Um, so we want to make sure that we have, we have field day. Uh, and so I had a conversation recently with Ms. McNally at Washington Drive, uh, and she assured me that they are planning uh, a field day. We're not exactly sure what it's going to look like. It's kind of like the conversation I had with our uh, seniors over at the high school where we ha might have to reimagine the event a, a little bit, but we are looking to have field day. Um, in the past, we've bused students over to the high school, and I don't know that that necessarily can happen, um, but we will have uh, some type of field day in place for our students uh, and more information to come on that, but a very important question. Great. Thank you. And another Washington Drive question. Um, next year for the 2021-2022 the school year, will hot lunch be restored? Hot lunch, okay. Hot lunch. Uh, hot lunch. Yeah, so, you know, with the reorganization of the building due to COVID, um, the use of the cafeteria has been you know, limited. And so when you can't provide, uh, when you can't have students eating in, in, in lunch, and, and that's one of the challenges, I'll be honest, at the secondary level too, is because, you know, obviously people eat with their masks now. Uh, and so when you have that, you want to keep as much distance as possible between individuals, and especially our primary level students, you know, and they move around quite a bit. So we have, uh, you know, the, it's, it's a challenge. So, so, you know, a very logistic challenge. One thing that would be not be feasible would be to bring hot lunches to classrooms. It just wouldn't, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. We've evaluated that. We've heard this concern before. We've looked at it. We've gone back. We've looked at it. The only answer he gives to this question is, and I, I don't want to seem like I'm going back to that same point, but if regulations change and we are able to use our cafeteria space more efficiently, then we can, we can revisit that. But if we have to maintain classroom spaces as lunch spaces, I don't see how that, how that could work. But again, we would continue to evaluate that um, going forward. Because I know it's important. I know people have asked about that. Okay, so uh, what are your goals, not the state-based goals for students at the elementary? Oops. It's... Uh, Ms. Mason, I think you- Did it cut oh, out? Yeah, yeah, it cut out there for a second. 
If you can repeat that. So I will repeat that question. So what are your goals, not the state-based goals for students at the elementary level? And what is your measured plan to show progress? Okay. So, uh, you know, for this, when it, we know that when we emerge from this, we know that's when the real work is, is going to begin. We, you know, there's no doubt that what we're doing right now is challenging. It is it's, it's so challenging on so many levels. And our teachers, as I said before, have risen above and beyond. And our teacher assistants, uh, all the support staff, everybody. So when, you know, look at when we get back to bringing students back and maybe a more normal uh, environment, you know, there's a lot of limitations right now. The ability, for example, to do small group work and to, to do all these things, you know, effectively is really difficult and challenging at the elementary level, you know, where the teachers are using having the, the carpet, you know, and you have, the, okay, we'll get the class together on the carpet and we'll do some reading. It'll just, you know, these are all things that, uh, you know, our teachers have, have overcome and they've done a great thing. When I go back to our vision statement, if, if you let me is, you know, each child, each day, one Harbor Fields family. And the metaphor behind that is, is kind of like that saying, like, I don't know if you ever heard it, like, how do you eat an elephant? Somebody tells you, eat an elephant. How do you, there's only one way to eat an elephant. That's one bite at a time. So each child, each day as one family. And that's the approach to everything. Just as this year, and I don't know that people in, that are watching are aware of this, but when we opened the year, we assessed each child across grade levels in reading, writing, and math. And, and that assessment was provided to provide the teacher with a, an opening baseline of where that child is. And our motto has been the same as we need to meet the children where they are. And so that's the purpose of that. In addition to that, we have a very strong progress monitoring process that's in place. So for example, in the area of reading, we have regular, regular uh, Pontus and Pinnell F&P assessments, benchmark assessments where we determine reading levels and we provide appropriate texts for each child individually to get them reading at their level and to bring them up to grade level if they're not already there. And if they are to bring them beyond grade level. Uh, in addition to that, we have, for example, star assessments with star reading and star math assessments that provide benchmark data across grade levels that our teams use to make, to inform instructional decisions, to provide guidance on areas where we need to remediate. Uh, and then in addition to that, of course, we have individual teacher assessments that are provided. And assessments aren't necessarily tests. Assessments are you know, part of the questioning process, part of the instructional process that teachers use then to, to guide instruction. And then we have grade level teams that utilize data and, and work together to make changes as needed. So this work is gonna be especially crit, crit, uh, critical going forward, but I re I'm really fully confident in our, our teams. Uh, they have done a great job in the past. I know that to do a continued job on this in the future, but it's an area of detail that we need to, of course, pay close attention to. So in addition to that, we have our, our RTI process. And for those that are not familiar, we like to use acronyms in education. Uh, RTI stands for response to intervention. So our teachers work within the RTA proce RTI process to apply research-based interventions for children. So when children are struggling and they're not at grade level, we have a team, it's called the IST, Instructional Support Team. Again, another acronym, uh, where our team make recommendations on interventions based on the area of concern. And so the teacher applies those interventions through that process data is collected and the data is then discussed as a team. And then the decision is made to either continue with that intervention or apply a different intervention and again, data is collected, and this is an ongoing process that's done for each child. That process, uh, as you can imagine, is, is arduous, but our teachers do a wonderful job. Um, so if we go back to the premise of bringing, meeting children where they are, bringing them to, to grade level through the RTI and IST process, we're confident that we can, we can meet the needs of each child going forward. In addition to that, children that don't respond to interventions over time, there's obviously the referral process for additional support services that can be made. So I'm, I'm very confident and it allows me to sleep a, uh, sleep a bit at night knowing that our teachers have the tools necessary to, to make 
you know, to meet the children where they are. They have the skills and ability to bring them to, to grade level. And again, we, we, we continue to uh, move heaven and earth to, to uh, apply any interventions that we need to, to make sure we support all students. Um, so again, I would just encourage families because when I say that, that metaphor of our vision statement, each child, each day, one home fields family, that family connection is a really important dynamic in this. It's not just school, right? We need that school home connection. We need that communication uh, to, to make sure that we're doing what's right for each child. I, with my own children, I'll attend their family teacher, their, their parent teacher conferences, and the teacher might speak about my child. And I wonder, I'm like, are you, are you talking about my child? Are you, you know, because they'll say how wonderful and this and that. And I'll, you know, I'll be able to point out where, for example, if I work with my son on homework um, and I see that he's struggling, I might be able to point that out to the teacher. And then we work together on interventions that I can apply at home to help him in accordance with what the teacher is doing in the classroom and, and build that support. So that's something that, uh, you know, that we would encourage families to do is to keep that open line of communication with, with their classroom teachers. Okay, thank you. Um, since many of our students have been home for a year now, what programs will or can Harbor Fields offer to help overcome school phobia or nervous nervousness about returning to school? This is a this is an excellent question and um, one that we know that we are going to to face. Uh, before COVID, it wasn't like school phobia and anxiety didn't exist. Obviously, it did. So. When we work with students, and the one thing I can just try to encourage families with is that sometimes there's a, a apprehension about communicating with the school, that nervousness, uh, that, that school phobic, you know, the, that battle uh, they might have about going to school. And we need, that, we need that communication. We need to understand the issues that you're facing at home because your child may experience that at home and tell you about that at home but not necessarily show that physically or verbally in school. So it's important that homeschool connection is there. On top of that, the, um, once we establish that connection or the, either the school initiates that conversation or the home initiates that conversation, we have uh, plenty of resources through the use of, of counselors, uh, psychologists and social workers that are available to assist families. Um, we have our own school-based interventions and they're almost too numerous to, to list here, but I would encourage any families to visit our curriculum instruction page. And we have our comprehensive school developmental guidance plan that's up on the website. And that lists all of the interventions that are in place uh, for our students. But at the end of the day, what we want to have happen is we want the school and the home to engage in a conversation of support because each child is unique and we wanna make sure we support each child. What I will say is that if it gets, if it rises to the level of a true school phobia, oftentimes there's a referral to outside counseling because the school cannot be a primary counselor for a child, but we do obviously offer support. So the best interventions I've seen in my experience uh, working with students for 25 years is when we have a recognized case, and we are able to provide you know, both inside and outside counseling support, it's helpful when those two counselors can then communicate with each other and share strategies and speak a common language to the child and support the child through that. That's really beneficial. So you know, we understand that that is going to be a concern because it's hard to believe, right? I just read an article yesterday. I think yesterday was the first, the anniversary of the first positive case in New York State. And then by the 16th, we were shut down. So that's how rapid that, that went. And at the time it was, okay, we're gonna be closed for two weeks. And then it was two weeks more. And then maybe it was, you know, so it eventually got to, we had no idea we were gonna be where, where we are today. So fast forward now to almost a year from that position, we know that a tra any transition is nerve wracking. Think about when your children transition from home to kindergarten or from, Washington Drive to TJL or TJL to OMS, there's always that apprehension. 
uh, of going back to school and going to a different school, a different place. So it's almost like that for children when we open up and return to normal. They might be nervousness about the number of students in there. They might be nervousness about if uh, you know with the with the virus and, and things of that nature. So we we know we're well aware of those concerns. Uh, but I, I go back to the basics of the importance of that relationship between home and school, communication. Uh, please take the social stigma of communicating that away and just communicate with the school and make sure that we're there to support. If there are behaviors that are manifesting at home that we're not aware because children, they, they were very resilient. And so they might speak to you at home or, or display some behavior at home, but they're not doing that at school. And, it, it might be more difficult for us to identify that. So just make sure that those conversations are happening with the school so that we can provide the supports that are needed to support each child each day and get them to, to a place where, you know, they're comfortable again in school. And, you know, we're very confident in that process. It's been very successful for us in the past, again, pre-COVID, and we continue to, uh, to operate that way going forward. Thank you so much. It's really vital information for our, our families and our kids. Uh, so will Harbor Fields be doing any baseline testing of students in September to see if they have any educational gaps? Yep, so great question because uh, you know I'm so proud of the work we did last summer. We've got teams of teachers together. And we developed those baselines uh, for each grade level of reading, writing, and math all the way up through high school. And uh, it was so valuable for us. So we do plan on doing that again um, and uh, just providing that baseline of information for our teachers. Um, it's not an assessment that is used to, you know, for a grade for a student necessarily. It is an informational tool for teachers to understand where students are, where they, where they should be and where they are um, so that we can better drive instruction. Um, so I look forward to that work continuing and supporting our students, supporting our staff uh, in that process. Thank you. Okay, two more. We're almost there. <laughs> um, has there been any discussion on whether Regents will be canceled this year? All right, it's a good question. So um, I'm going to, you know, forgive me if I'm talking in, in ways that people already understand, but the back, I'm going to back up a little bit. New York State applied for a waiver for testing. And why, why would New York State need to do that? So the federal government formulate the race to the top and now Ed every student succeeds act provides funding to states in it for education. So part of that funding are requirements and some of the requirements are testing. And that's where, if you recall back in the day, some of the changes through the three through eight testing and so three through eight testing in ELA, math, science, social studies, and then also the regions exam. So, that's all part of that. So the New York State applied for a waiver this year for the testing. They were rejected on that waiver and they applied again, thinking that the changing in the federal administration would, pro would provide granting of that waiver. Uh, we were, a, a press release was issued by the Biden administration basically saying that states need to test. So that wasn't official, but that was a statement, right? So. What we take from that is that we are going to have to issue the 3 through 8 testing. So now that goes back to the state. So now New York State has a Board of Regents. The Board of Regents oversees public schools. The Board of Regents is meeting later this month in March, and we're gonna find out more information about that. So my basic answer to that question is no, Regents exams don't appear to be canceled this year. Um, same with the 3 through 8 testing. It appears that goes on. And I go back to my original conference, my, my rant earlier on about guidance and that, you know, normally by now I'm communicating with families saying the three, three testings are, tests are on these dates and these are the, you know, these are the dates, these are the times. Normally we send those letters out, but obviously we couldn't do that because we didn't know where, where everything was. Um, so now we're, we're waiting, anxiously awaiting the outcome of this Board of Regents meeting to get further information on what this is gonna look like. Are there going to be flexible, is there gonna be flexibility within the testing windows? Are they gonna, you know, what are the official dates? All those things that kind of need to be worked out. 
But we do know, based on the information we have so far, it appears that testing will take place. And once we have that information, we'll be sending it out to families uh, very shortly. Okay, so we've, uh, we've made it to the end here, but of course it's a multi-part question, uh, shifting outside of the classroom again. So will spectators be allowed at the fall outside sports? Uh, what will be the protocol of a player test positive for COVID? And will the whole team have to uh, quarantine if so? Right. So great question. Regarding sports, I think um, it's important for the community to understand the uh, governance of, of public sports and uh, sports in public high schools. So the sports in public high schools, I'll give you the quick version, is governed by the New York State Public High School Athletic Association, NISPA. We love, we love acronyms. So that's the public uh, governance of New, York, of New York State sports. Then each county has their own section. We happen to belong to section 11. So New York State will set rules. Pre-COVID, they would set rules on like heat alerts when it's too hot to play, the rules of each game, they'll do the state competitions, uh, concussion management, um, first aid, defibrillators, all those things. They provide guidance on all those things. Then that goes down to counties and the counties can take those regulations and make them more restrictive. Uh, but that's the minimum guidance that they have to operate under. So when it comes to uh, the pandemic, New York State released guidance went down to the county level. And each county was allowed to, again, be more restrictive on that guidance. So Suffolk County, section 11, made decisions with regard to spectators uh, for the winter season that just ended, that they were not permitting win uh, spectators at, at those games. I've heard that spectator, that decision is being reconsidered for the fall season. Now it's part for the community to understand Fall, when I say fall, I mean the, the sports that would normally happen in the fall now are happening now. So we're calling it the fall season, but it's really those fall sports that are happening now. Um, so those sports uh, are, are, are proceeding, but um, we're, we heard that they're reconsidering that decision. So once we receive official guidance, we'll be communicating that to families um, as far as what spectators are allowed. I've heard rumors of, you know, 50% of the capacity or two spectators per player. You know, you hear various things, but I, I always like to wait for official words before I say anything uh, uh, on that. But once that comes out, we'll be communicating with families on that. Um, you know, with regard to the positive cases, when a child tests positive, the contact tracing process associated with that, I should say when a student or a staff, right? anybody test positive, the contact tracing process is the same. And that's dictated by Suffolk County Department of Health. And that is requirement for anybody that's within six feet of that individual for 10 minutes or more prior, 48 hours prior to either the positive test or the symptoms. So if I test positive today and I didn't have symptoms up to this point, we're looking back for two days prior. If I started developing symptoms today, but I test positive on Friday, still looking back 48 hours prior to, to today. So we follow the same rules for, for sports. Doesn't matter, contact tracing is contact tracing. So we would go through that process. Now the process is made more difficult when people are close together, like in sports. Uh, so like in a classroom right now at the high school or OMS, I have six feet, six feet between each individual. Um, contact tracing is a lot easier than even at the elementary school where children are closer together. And it's more difficult in a sports situation where teams are practicing in very close proximity to each other, uh, especially for our high risk sports, right? So that process will continue. And if it results in the whole team quarantining, that's what it is. We don't have flexibility with regard to contact tracing. We can't say, ah, I know it says 10 minutes of six feet or less, but I don't worry about it. I can't do that. You know, uh, we have to abide by those rules with regard to contact tracing. So that's, uh, that's the case with that. Um, but again, I go back to thanking our athletes that just finished this season for the 100% negative. So I just wanna take a moment in that process to thank people because I don't, you know, I'm sure the community is aware that all of this is a very arduous process, but our administrators, our staff, our coaches, our athletes, 
their families. I just can't thank everybody enough for doing everything that they had to do to make it a, a, a reality for our students to play. Not just the high-risk sports, but all sports. Uh, because we do feel very strongly that it is a, an important part of what we do. Uh, and we, we value sports. We, we know the, the role that it plays. You know, I recall as a high school principal, um, you know, students that participated in sports, you know, if you, even if they struggled academically, they sat up straight and they were on time when the season was there. So, you know, I wanted to, you know, we want to make sure that we have every opportunity for our students to engage in the life of school and sports is a, an important part of that process. Um, so we value that and we appreciate all the work that everybody did to make sure that our students are able to participate. Well, that wraps up all of the questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Manning, for taking the time. Thank you to the entire team for taking time out of your day um, to give us very thoughtful, detailed responses. And I know that the community is looking forward to the upcoming Board of Ed meeting and learning more about um, you know, OMS and the high school and as well as the budget. So um, you know, to all of our PTA members and community members who joined today, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our units for the very thoughtful questions that you provided to us. So we could get more information out to the community. Thank you. And I just want to, if I could add a quick uh, note that I, I should have said at the beginning, I hope uh, the community understands that we are, you know, accessible. If people have questions and concerns, they don't necessarily have to wait until events such as this, although I appreciate this. I think it's such a valuable format and plan to continue in the future. But uh, certainly we are accessible if there are questions that come up. Uh, please call, email. Uh, we'd be happy to, to talk anytime. Great. Thank you, everyone. All right. Thank Have you. Have a good day. Have a great day. Bye.